I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life in Nicaragua. Over the last few days, we tried a, new, a few new video formats. We did some background information on why you might want to move to Nicaragua, why I moved to Nicaragua, about my adventures coming down, and you guys had a number of comments and questions and such. We're going to touch on some of those as I walk through the southern extent of the most remote portion that could possibly be considered part of the Barrio of Sutiava today here in Leon, Nicaragua. We are super far south. I'm going to bring up a map once we get into the show and uh, kind of give you a feel for where we're starting off and we're just going to walk through a lot of countryside and talk about your guys' uh, comments and questions and stuff from the show all about living here in Nicaragua. It is a really warm day and uh, I did nearly three miles walking out to this point. So I'm now headed home. So I'm like hot and quite dusty and sweaty and a little bit tired, but I wanted to get some interesting new footage for you guys. I've never been down where we are right now. I've been kind of in the general vicinity, but this is new to me as well as new to, I'm gonna guess all of you. The chances that anyone has ever shown this area on YouTube before, or that any of you have ever been here before, even those of you who live in Leon have probably never been here before, even the normal people, 99% of Leon has never been here before. We're really, really out there. I'm going to take this moment and pop up a map, and when you get back from staring at this map and being like, yeah, that's, that's out there, I'm going to show you just a little bit of what we got around here. So if you look this way, we got a farm kind of over here, like a farmhouse behind me, and then dirt road behind me, and then over here we've got a field. Hopefully you can see it a bit. And I'm going to be walking into the sun. I can't do my walk and talk from behind the camera deal that I love to do so much. So we're heading down this way because I'm having those problems with the lavalier mic. So go watch. I don't know which old episodes I tried to do some walking with that lavalier and the sound is just terrible and I haven't gotten that fixed yet. I'm hoping it's as simple as replacing the mic uh, and that I can do in March, which brings me to the first comment and topic I want to talk about for the day. And that is amusement parks here in Nicaragua. So I was having a conversation with my buddy Jason today and he said, you know, there's a lot of things that sound really good about Nicaragua. He's hoping to come down this summer. Maybe he'll be on the show, but uh, he's looking at coming. Uh, he's looking at Nicaragua, just kind of it j takes a very, you know, an interest in it. And he said, you know, one of the things I just can't give up in my first world life, he lives in central United States in Nebraska. And uh, he said, is amusement parks. He loves amusement parks. Specifically, he likes Disney and Six Flags, but you could also substitute Universal Studios, something like that would be, uh, would be the same, right? And so, yeah, the United States has pff, gotta be the world's best amusement parks. Right now, Germany has some great ones. There's some other places that do have amusement parks. China, I think is pretty good. I've never been, I'm just hypothesizing. Um, I wanna show, I'm just coming by Miss Cow here. How you doing? Just on the road, there's nothing here. Nobody's here. I have no idea why there's a cow, but uh, cow in the road. Yeah. Anyway, so the U.S. really shines. At least it's one of the world leaders in amusement parks at the very least. So, okay, great. So he loves amusement parks. And this, this is important for me because my, my family is going to Disney World. Uh, well, none of us like Six Flags. No offense, Six Flags. Just I grew up by Six Flags. Not my thing. I like the other stuff at Disney, not the thrill rides, but that, everybody has their own thing. But I do enjoy Disney and my wife and I, a lot of our early travel stuff, our, our early podcast on travel was heavily centric, uh, centered on Disney World because uh, we were really like advanced Disney travelers, very serious about it, did all kinds of things, knew all the restaurants, like we were into it when we were young and before we had kids and we could afford to go all the time because we did, because we lived in like New York. and we Anyway, so we're taking the kids to Disney World coming up here in March. Then we're basically in February at this point. So we're like, ah, six weeks away. So this is a current thing for me. We already bought our tickets to fly up there. We've already paid for a whole bunch of the hotels and stuff. So we have a really good idea of what it's like going to Disney World from Nicaragua. So when he said this, I said, you know, well, how far are you from Disney World? And then he thought about it and we looked at the flights and everything. It is faster and cheaper, I think, for me from Nicaragua to go to Disney World than it is for him in Nebraska. He has to fly from a small airport to a larger airport and then fly way across the country. Whereas I'm actually physically, I believe, closer or equidistant uh, there, but my flights go directly from uh, Managua to Florida. You know, like I'm not going out of the way at all. I don't have to make like extra stops. I do have to fly through Miami. I can't go directly to Florida 
to Orlando, but it's not bad at all. I'm walking relatively close to the airport and there's actually a helicopter. This has to be one of only maybe three helicopters I have seen in all the time I've been in Nicaragua. That's wild, I have no idea why there's a helicopter there. Oh, that made me pay attention to this cool field I'm here by. It's gonna pop up here and show this horse walking by. So this brings up an interesting point that so often when making comparisons or thinking about, like this is, this probably applies to a lot of you, if you especially if you live in the United States, but certainly if you live in Canada too, you, you have a certain amount of, well, up here, right, North America, whatever, we have, and then you list these things, and, and that's true, North America's got so much stuff. It's so much bigger than Central America, it's so much richer than Central America, it has a lot of stuff. And I grew up up there, I, I get it, right? <clears throat> but a really important point that is often forgotten is, you know, if I grew up in, in uh, Western New York, right, my access to Florida was, was, is nowhere near as good as my access to Florida from here in Nicaragua. So, what does having Disney World even mean in that context? It's not in my home state. Uh, does state borders matter? Does the fact that it's in your country or not in your country make any difference at all? Does that actually apply in some way? Now, the question is, where do you want to be a citizen of? Where do you want to have the rights to travel? Well, okay, it's a different discussion. If you uh, are, oh, look at all the... <clears throat> I'm going to be in their way in just a minute, so we're going to move along before I get trampled. Um, so, what does it even mean? How do, how do you use those terms? Because it's not like you own Disney World. Uh, but so, so where you're a citizen does matter. So if you're a citizen of Nicaragua, not of the United States, you often have travel problems. So going to the United States can be very hard. But if you're a citizen of the United States or you're a Nicaraguan who has a travel visa, then going to the United States is very easy. And that makes Disney World either kind of hard to get or impossible to get to or super easy to get to. It all depends. And, uh, and of course, access from Nicaragua to the United States is very much limited to the the points of entry that you go into in the United States. So places like Miami and Los Angeles and Houston are very good. Places like New York, ah, eh, not so good. However, I have flights directly from Rochester, New York, which is a small airport out west, all the way to Managua, $106. It's not super fast, there's a layover, no big deal though. Right, like super cheap, really easy. Um, we're pretty accessible. So as long as you have the right to enter the U.S., so if you have a U.S. passport, Canadian passport, whatever, the accessibility of the services and, and features and theme parks in the United States is honestly exactly the same as it is from inside the United States. It's no different. It's kind of like that really interesting, I saw this in a meme or something recently, but it's one of the most interesting things. And I've probably said it on the show, but it never stops being interesting. If you're at the northern point of Brazil, and this is not a trick, this is not like there's an island somewhere or there's like a peninsula, nothing like that. If you just go to the northern point of Brazil and you take a compass, like the kind you had in school where you put a needle in and then you draw with a, right? And you measure the distance of every country in, in the Americas, not in North America, not in South America, all of the Americas, so the Caribbean, North America, South America, all of it, and you take the nearest point of any one of those countries, so you make the, the compass wide enough that every single, so just in case you're wondering, the country whose nearest point is farthest from Northern Brazil is Canada. Not a surprise at all. Canada's the farthest country in the Americas from Brazil? Who would have guessed, right? Okay, so it is. So that point is somewhere around, I wanna say uh, Nova Scotia, but I'm not sure. But that's, that's the nearest point where it crosses uh, that, that line. If you were to do that and make the compass just big enough to hit the nearest point of Canada, that would still be closer than the farthest southern point of Brazil from the northern point. That's how big Brazil is. That's how far it is from one side of Brazil to the other. So there are, in theory, people in Canada who, as the crow flies, can get to parts of Brazil faster than some people in Brazil can, if they all were taking off by airplanes and flying in direct lines and things like that. 
that's really super interesting, but it gives you some context that when you start comparing resources in a giant country like the United States versus what we have in Nicaragua, you have to think about them a little bit differently. Ooh, it got kind of dark all of a sudden. I mean, I'm in trees, but there's like clouds and trees and it's not really that warm anymore. Like, wow. And uh, oh, I just gotta show this view of the mountains. The big one on the left there is San Cristobal over in Chinandega. So that gives you a feeling of how far away it is. Remember, on a super wide lens on the GoPro, so it's much closer than it looks. From here, they're kind of looming in a, in a way. I really want to come out, do some of these walks with one of the new cameras and really get some of these views, but it's so, so hard to carry that stuff on a hot day. Like, whoa, it's a bit much. This is a really neat path that I'm walking down. We have a nice breeze today, so as long as I'm in this shade, this is super comfortable. It's only because I was hoofing it hard for three miles uh, and in the bright sunlight on the way out that I'm feeling warm. If I wasn't for that, I'd be so comfortable right now. This is beautiful. It's a really nice day. So, so this whole concept of who has these resources, are those American resources that he has more than me? Or those resources that I have more than him, I'm closer, it's easier for me to go. So it's a, it becomes semantics. Yes, they fall inside the lines of the United States, but does that mean anything? If it's not in your state or if it's not nearby, does it really mean much? Like is, is uh, you know, is it Yellowknife, Yukon? They're more connected to most of Can to Alaska than, than most of the U.S. is. If there's a resource in Alaska that they're going to all the time, or Alaskans are going to resources in Yukon or Northwest Territory all the time, which is their resource? Which thing do you refer to as an advantage for you? Well, if you take it in a, the first world or the United States has Disney World, then yes, the United States does. I have a pack of dogs that suddenly surprised me there. If we're, wow, if we're working from these little puppies, and there's a bunch of chickens and puppies out in the field. If you're, you know, looking at who owns the properties, if you're looking at what country it falls in, yes, the United States has those things. But if we're looking at who has access to those things, well, we have kind of equal access. So it's important to just contextualize a little bit and remember that we don't think of the world when you actually like live here or you live in the United States, right? The United States has access to Nicaragua. It's very easy, it's two hours away. You can come down anytime you want. Buenas. And likewise, from here, we can go up and use the resources up there when they make sense, and we do. So, so that's important. And, and Six Flags, we brought up as well. The nearest Six Flags for him is in Dallas, which is my old Six Flags. And while he can probably get to the Dallas Six Flags faster than me, I can get to the Houston Six Flags faster than him. So, and if it comes to just who can get to a Six Flags, I've got a slight edge. Uh, it's also worth noting that the United States is not the sole proprietor of theme parks. And here in Nicaragua, we really don't have any. Like, don't even, don't even give it a try. Like, you'll be so disappointed if you even find anything. In this region, it's always chickens in the field. In this region, if you're really looking for a theme park, you're stuck going to Guatemala. That is essentially our nearest ones. Now, if you want eco parks, Costa Rica has them in spades. And we have some here too. But Costa Rica is the leader. They're like the United States. When it comes to eco parks, they've got it all. Guatemala has a number of theme parks. Some of them are pretty decent. None of them are Disney World by any stretch, but they have some real theme parks that you can go to and it, it would be pretty interesting. I'm really hoping this road goes through because I'm coming up on a wall. Fingers crossed that this goes somewhere. I think it turns, I think we're okay. This is the problem with just exploring on foot. You can end up in some pretty remote places and then what do you do? All right, so. Uh, also, Mexico has quite a few theme parks, and they have some big ones. Guatemala has some serious ones, but Mexico has some giant ones. And of course, you can reach all those from the United States quite easily too. So it's not like we have dramatically better access to Guatemala than the United States does. A flight from the US to Guatemala or a flight from the United States to Mexico is very, very easy. Same as here, but it is worth noting. Mexico, we're kind of split. It's roughly equal. Most of their, their theme parks there are in Cancun. That's a big spot for it, as you might imagine. But uh, for Guatemala, the, the main location for them is near Quetzaltenango. Or if you watch, there's got to be something more. He showed, they call it Shela, 
right? But the city that is the second city of, of Guatemala, the one in the north near Mexico, is known as either Shela or Quetzaltenango. That region, a little bit on the south side, somewhat towards Lake Atitlan, is the area of a lot of the theme parks. And uh, so if you're flying in from the United States, you fly into Guatemala City, and then you travel up to, to Quetzaltenango. If you're coming from Nicaragua, we can also fly into Guatemala City and take the same trip to Quetzaltenango, or we can take a bus from here and bus the whole way through, which is not a super attractive way to go. It's a really long bus, but we do have bus options that Americans generally don't, but they're not good options. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if that matters, but uh, so this is interesting. I'll show where I popped out and why I was lost. So we just came from behind me and then off to the left, I'm not going down this way. I have no idea where it goes. But we'll take a moment while we're standing here and bring up a map so you can see where we've come to and then we can figure out what's down there because it looks attractive but i do want to head home i want to have dinner at some point point. and then we've got these fields over here by the way these giant dark trees that are all around are mangoes and then we're heading this way all right this is northbound that we're facing we're walking up this path so we've been coming kind of west and so we just turned north all right my next question and i don't have all my notes in front of me so i don't know who asked these so my apologies to everyone that uh, but before i answer i just want one super appreciate everyone who wrote in especially yesterday there was, there was quite a few uh with questions and comments and, and and discussion about things that we said uh which is fantastic and and that stuff is what gives me the material to talk about so much of the time sometimes i i come up with things like i encounter things and they're interesting and sometimes uh, I use vidIQ and get some ideas from it, but it's mostly garbage, like 99% of the time. But once in a while, it'll give me a gem. The last couple days, I had saved up from some from them and used it. Uh, but in general, it's not very good. <laughs> it's, uh, it gives me some super generic stuff that doesn't apply to my channel. Um, if it applies, it does okay. But uh, mostly it's like, here's what people who aren't your show people, like my, my members, here's what they want to see. But... That's great for drawing in new people. So welcome to the new people that came because of that. So glad to have you here. Um, but for you guys who are here all the time, uh, it's like, oh, that's not material we're necessarily looking for. I, th I hope I hope I make it interesting, but you know, but so thank you to the new people and thank you to everyone who had comments and stuff on yesterday's show. And uh, I'm gonna show this field here in a second as I get a clearing. So many chickens running around here. This truck coming down the road is going to be a little bit tight. I have nowhere to go. Uh, oh, I do. If I walk forward just a little bit, I can get out of his way. Make faces at him. Step over here. All right. That type of truck is called a Ruda. I don't know what it's doing out here, but uh, they drive through town and it's like the cheapest form of public transportation that we have. And uh, oh, look at this little community just kind of opens up and is suddenly there. There's so many hidden communities in Nicaragua. That's like secret communities. Nicaragua, the secret community. It should be like Nicaragua, the secret community story. Something like that. Secret communities, the Nicaragua story. One way or another, I have that book title. Anyway, so, uh, so for all of you, take a moment. Think about things you want to know and uh, go down there in the comments and let me know about them, right? That is that is the best way. I mean, obviously come down and say hi, talk to other people, leave your experiences on things. Sometimes we read those on the show, but, but getting questions or like deep discussions on topics or places for me to go, those are a little bit harder because I like to go places. I don't always have time, but anything you can do like that, any, any questions you have, that's literally how we get the, the content for the show. So that's fantastic if you guys can do that because we have to put this out every day. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. Buenas. Okay, so the next question up was, what do I think, this is in the context of, of the show yesterday where I'd moved to Nicaragua, uh, what do I think of Panama and Costa Rica? So this is actually, um, there's a lot of people who live in one of these countries who have no experience with the others, and so anything they answer is very speculative. But for me, uh, I lived in Panama before Nicaragua, and uh, so Costa Rica lies between the two, which makes it so I've kind of got a bunch of experience in the range, and I'm in Costa Rica a few times a year simply because when you live in Nicaragua, chances are, oh, we got some beautiful light now. This is great. Uh, you, get, uh, you, you use Costa Rica because we're all such small countries. It's part of our ecosystem here, and it's got really good airport access, and it's got really good food and some shopping. So we tend to be in Costa Rica a bit, and it's our place for doing border runs because if we need to do a border run, which is not very often, then Costa Rica is the place to be. Hola. <laughs> 
because uh, it is our nearest hard border. By far, it is our nearest border. All right, I have to figure out where I am before I make a turn, because I'm gonna get lost. It is a good thing I looked at the map. I would definitely have guessed the wrong direction to go. I'm just a little bit south of anywhere I've ever walked before, so we're still in the process of new stuff for me. And all my walking to get here, because you're like, Scott, you just walked there. But I didn't. I walked way out and around a different way, and I'm taking a completely different path back. Buenas well, tardes. And so this is actually all new roads to me. Pretty soon I'll be coming into Buenas, coming into an area that I have been in before, but uh, I actually did quite a bit, probably a mile and a half, at least a mile of my walk out today was in new areas for me. And then everything so far that you've seen on the show has been new as well. Now the walk back is much more rural. I took a more populated walk to where I was still pretty rural, but a bit more than where we are. I've got, uh, I've got the Ruta coming back. So the Ruta is, which just stands for the truck on the route, right? They're basically pickup trucks, but with a, they're a little bit less than a pickup truck, I guess. And they have a covering and they got space on the back and people just pile in. And then, so it's like 15 cents or something to ride. They're really, really cheap. They're also uncomfortable and uh, a little bit difficult to use. I've never used one, but, but it's common. Everyone does because they're really cheap and they go everywhere. They go to the most remote places. They're really cheap to operate. So they're, uh, they're a popular way to get around, especially in areas like this. So uh, that one's empty, but quite often they're packed full, especially during commuting hours. Right now it is a Wednesday afternoon, I believe. It is pretty pretty quiet right now everywhere I go. So what do I think of these countries? Well, first of all, I love all three, right? Including Nicaragua. It's, it's a fantastic region. Um, they're all really strong considerations. None of them are like, you shouldn't go here, but they are quite different. So let's talk about them a little bit. So Costa Rica, uh, which borders Nicaragua, sits between the two, is very, so it's unique in the region. All countries are unique, right? But Costa Rica is super unique because it is extremely expensive, very Americanized. So if you're, if you're looking for an experience that's a lot more uh, closer to home, you want access to a lot of people who speak English, you want uh, access to a really large city. The capital city of San Jose is uh, almost double the size of Managua and much more urbane, full of amazing restaurants and bars and cocktail lounges and music scene and just a lot going on. It's a really nice city. Um, it's also a lot more dangerous, but it's got a lot of people and a lot of stuff to do. And there's a lot of it that you can walk around and it's got neighborhoods that are just fantastic. I really want to spend a lot more time there because there's so much I'd love to see with cool neighborhoods with great architecture and so much to show you guys. I need to spend more time in Costa Rica and I'm sure that I will uh, just in time as a as we're down here, it's, it's easier and easier to get down there. It just, as you're in any place, it gets easier to do all kinds of things you get used to doing stuff. So I love Costa Rica um, for its, its really broad array of amenities. And, you know, if Costa Rica was really inexpensive, like in Nicaragua, I think it would, it would be really hard to rule it out in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's not as safe, but it's still really safe. It's got really amazing ecology and ecological activities. Uh, it is really green. It's got cooler weather. It has hot weather like Nicaragua, but it also has like San Jose is a city of really mild temperatures. So it's much easier for Americans normally to go there and enjoy the, the weather because it's not so hot. And it's only hot when you go to the beach. <laughs> Everybody wants to be on the show. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very packed with tourists. So if your goal is to have a lot more food, a lot more activities, a lot more of, of, uh, more of a touristy experience where things are more polished, things are more fancy, there's more variety and there's more English and access to other expats then Costa Rica is almost certainly going to be far and away your winning location. Costa Rica is so strong for that. It has great communities, enclaves, but even if you don't live in an enclave, you can get a lot more as an expat in Costa Rica than you can in Nicaragua in general. The Nicaragua has its spots, but Costa Rica is like that nearly everywhere, or at least in really large areas. 
the biggest negative of Costa Rica is really just how expensive it is. Or if you're like us, one of the big negatives for Costa Rica is we really want to be a part of a place. We really want an incredibly strong culture where we get to be very steeped in it. And obviously, and I don't mean to imply that Costa Rica doesn't have a, just as strong a culture as everyone else, that it doesn't have all of this community and all these great things that Nicaragua has. But what it does have is so many tourists so many expats, so many non-Costa Ricans everywhere that if you're not Costa Rican, it's not that you can't get into the culture, it's not that you can't get away from the tourists, but the effort to do so, the complexity of doing so is very high. If you come to Nicaragua and you want to be in with Nicaragua, you want to live like a Nicaraguan, you want to experience Nicaraguan life, you want to do what I'm doing right now, which you don't want to do, I'm sure, but if you did, then Nicaragua offers this and it is so easy. You have to actually go quite a bit out of your way to create a situation where you are not actively involved with the Nicaraguans. You have to seek out the remote, distant uh, areas, mostly the Rivas beaches or parts of Granada. But even in Granada, it's not, it doesn't really apply like that. It's almost exclusively the Rivas beaches, or, which is San Juan del Sur and up to like Popoyo, kind of that, that stretch. Those areas are dominated by expats, but those are not in the, in the heavily populated part of, of the main portion of Nicaragua. They're, they don't have the airport. They don't have much of anything. They're actually really remote, um, <laughs> much more remote than, than you would believe, right? For those of us who live up here and are connected to the country, we can get anywhere in the country so fast. We have access to all the resources. We have all the cities. We have all the interesting things, all the activities. And then you talk to the expats and they're all living, not all, but a really large percentage are living in super remote hard to get to very empty areas and you're like gosh the, the amount of stuff you give up to live out there like hermits it's weird but it's also beautiful and remote and everybody speaks English and it's, it's a very it's a completely different experience right two completely different worlds hence why we call it the two Nicaraguas I have an episode on that from a while ago we're going to take a break let the camera cool down and let this truck go by so it doesn't make so much noise all right, I had major technical difficulties with my camera and I ended up recording everything in high speed. So an entire 20 or 30 minutes easily of show that I recorded for you about Costa Rica was lost. That's just awesome. So I'm doing my best to recreate it now. So Costa Rica compared to Nicaragua, there's a lot of similarities. Honestly, they share a lot of culture, a lot of history, a lot of culinary uh, things, and a lot of southern Nicaragua isn't that different than Costa Rica. It's We often refer to it that way. And they share a region, northwestern uh, Costa Rica, an area very popular with expats is the Guanacaste, and that is a uh, formerly disputed region. The southern part of Nicaragua is Guanacaste, and Guanacaste is a reference to being Nicaraguan. That is is like saying Nicaraguense. So it's actually called the Nicaragua region of Costa Rica just in the native language. So Costa Rica is very different than Nicaragua in general, in, in many of its aspects. And the things that make it so incredibly different or that, uh, and you can see that's how little everything was compressed into, it's just that little bit of video. So uh, Costa Rica gives you a, a so much more uh, touristy, polished experience. It's you're across the whole country. So first of all, it's it's half the size physically of Nicaragua. It's about two thirds of the population and the number of tourists and expats is exponentially larger. It is just so many people. So you have a, a completely different experience because of how many tourists are there, how many expats live there. That means that there's an infrastructure for all that stuff. Getting around is, is so easy. Talking English to people all over the country, very easy, not 100%, but quite easy. Uh, your ability to find other expats. It's not like uh, in Nicaragua where you could uh, always run into one if you, if you, you know, are looking or you're paying attention. Yeah, we're out there. But if you're going around Leon, you can spend a day in Leon and, and never really see an expat. You can go out to dinner, not see an expat. Even at really fancy restaurants here in Leon, you could easily not see an expat on an evening. Of course, easily you could as well. But if you're in like a Granada or San Juan del Sur, you'd have a hard time finding Nicaraguans. It's not quite true, but there's an awful lot of expats. 
If you're in Managua, you could go a month without seeing an expat. If you're in Chinandega, you could go a lifetime. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different by different regions, but if you're in Costa Rica, you would expect to see expats unless you're making a real effort to get away from them basically all the time. It's really easy to have your everyday life be involved with expats, even if you don't live in an enclave. In Nicaragua, you can certainly choose enclaves, Rancho Santana, uh, San Juan del Sur, uh, Grand Pacifica. There's places where you can make an effort and be surrounded by, by expats, but you're in a little tiny bubble and not really part of Nicaraguan culture. But in Costa Rica, the expat touristy thing is actually at this point part of the Costa Rican experience. And so you can um, find that you're going to be mixed in with expats everywhere that you go, whether they're visiting or they live there. It's, it's just part of everyday life. And so that makes for a, an absolutely different experience. And that's not, not good or bad, just those are things you have to consider. If what you're looking for is that uh, escape, that, that completely changing culture, getting uh, away from what you're used to and, and jumping both feet into another place, Nicaragua is going to make that so much easier, so much more obvious, so much more in your face. And if you want to have an easy time where you're like, well, sure, I want to experience another place. I want to embrace Costa Rica. I want to embrace another culture, but I don't want to be like clueless. I don't want to be isolated. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to feel like I don't know how to do things. Then Costa Rica is going to give you that. It's such a different world. Now, of course, with that, Costa Rica is very expensive. It is the most expensive region in Latin America. Uh, you're going to spend more on everything, food, transport, uh, housing, everything's going to cost more, but you're going to be able to get much more Western Americanized, Canadianized uh, uh, houses, uh, vehicles, all kinds of things. Things tend to be fancy. Stores tend to be a lot more like an American shopping experience. Uh, the types of houses you're likely to have built are going to mimic, in many cases, more like American design. It's still going to be very Central American because you're in Central American. You do have to accommodate there are certain design features that are just practical in Central America. But in Nicaragua, a lot of the design features are going to be colonial, are going to be very Nicaraguan, are going to be very not American. They don't have that influence from the U.S. And they don't have people who are like, well, but I, this is what I'm used to in the U.S. How close can we get to that? They really don't get very much of that. So uh, you're going to feel immediately that what is considered a normal house in Nicaragua and a normal house in Costa Rica will probably be extremely different. Of course, if you get into small communities, you get away from tourists and expats, they're going to be really close. But in, in more, uh, more populated areas, if you, even if you come here to Leon, you go to Granada, your houses are going to be Nicaraguan. But if you're in cities of similar size or regions that are popular in, in Costa Rica, you're going to find housing, by and large, that is extremely Western. So little things like that. And of course, if you're in Nicaragua and that's what you want, there's ways to make it happen. And if you want the Nicaraguan really hardcore cultural experience in Costa Rica, of course, you can make it happen. But in both cases, you'll have to go out of your way and you'll have to make it something that, that works for you. It won't just be handed to you. It won't be, I got off the plane and this is what I found, right? Now, uh, Costa Rica also has a big city, San Jose. It is about double the size. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. I'm, I don't have all my notes as to which things got onto the recording already and which didn't. But San Jose is twice the size of, of Managua and is very urban, very urbane. Uh, you're going to have, you know, big shopping centers. You're going to have lots of restaurant variety, really cool, like just urban everything with like trains coming through and stuff. It feels so much like a giant modern European city, whereas Managua doesn't give you that feeling in any way. It, it feels like villages. Uh, it's very sprawling. Public transportation is there for you, but it, it feels like you're connecting from a village to a village, not like this integrated single city environment. Environment. You don't have the high rises, the shopping, any of the things in the way that you think of them in um, in, in a big city. Uh, but Costa Rica is going to give you that big city feel. So if the thing you want is big city, and these are the countries that you're looking at, Costa Rica is going to have the biggest one. Panama, we'll talk about Panama City when when we get to that, which I did manage to record. Uh, so overall, the, the biggest takeaways with Costa Rica, it's not quite as safe as Nicaragua, but it is pretty safe. It doesn't have the big gang violence, but because of so many tourists, it does have a little bit of touristy violence. Uh, it's just the, the targets are there. It's hard to resist. Um, and in San Jose, I will point out there are areas that I'm very worried about going into. I never have that problem. If I go to the worst barrios of Managua, and I spend time in Libertad. I spend time in Venezuela. I go to, to pretty rough areas. Ciudad Sandino. I go around and film in areas that people are like, these are the scariest things in Nicaragua. And I can tell you, not one of those bothers me in the least. 
none of them come close to just going to the bus station in Costa Rica. So you have to, there's a little bit there where you need to be like, okay, this, this really is a leap of, of danger between these places. Like when I say I go around Nicaragua, I think a lot of people are like, you're just ridiculous. You don't sense danger. But when I'm in Costa Rica, I do sense danger. I'm not terrified. I'm not like, I can't do this, but I do make decisions based on, I would be uncomfortable being there. I need to make sure I have someone with me. I'm not, you know, my backpack's not on my back. I got to carry it like this. I have to be super alert. I don't have to do that in Nicaragua ever. Should, maybe, but I don't need to, right? It, it, it is a difference. Um, Costa Rica is, is you know, it's going to cost more and it's going to be this much more westernized, um, mimicking America experience. That said, you certainly get Costa Rica when you're there. It is not so westernized, so Americanized that uh, coming from the U.S. that you won't be like, ah, oh, yeah, no, this is Costa Rica. But when you're coming from Nicaragua and you've been here for a long time, once you step into Costa Rica, you're like, how is this not America? Right now, if you go on to the U.S., then you're like, oh, that's how, right? But when you've been away for a while, you start to forget what the U.S. is actually like, and Costa Rica feels an awful lot like you've gotten there. Um, and, and it has a lot of chains that we don't have here in Nicaragua, like Taco Bell, right? Which is great. We love going there for that. So we love living here and having Costa Rica available to use. Now, if you're looking for the Eco Park experience, experience, all that touristy stuff, Costa Rica is going to be your biggest winner, for sure, of these countries. Uh, and, and Nicaragua will be the biggest loser. Uh, but if you're looking for um, an authenticity, a, a complete break with your formal lifestyle, or the absolute lowest cost experience where you're able to get the most amenities for your dollar, the biggest house, the, the, the biggest number of people to work for you, to you know, help out with things, the um, you know, lowest cost healthcare, whatever, Nicaragua is going to give you more bang for your buck than the other two by massive amounts. But it does that at a cost of there aren't going to be the expats, there isn't going to be the English, there isn't going to be the spit and polish on all the little things. And you will feel that all the time. And for some of us, that's actually kind of cool. Like when I go to Costa Rica, I really appreciate how polished everything is. But when I come back and when I, when I really want to live, I don't want that polish every day. I like stepping into it, enjoying it a little bit, and then going back. I like how rough around the edges, how unfinished Nicaragua feels. Um, and, and it's getting better right? And better. It's getting more polished uh, as time goes on, uh, simply because the infrastructure is improving, investments are happening, um, more things are being built, uh, and, and you see it really rapidly as, um, and you saw in the video, some of the barrios we walked through, some of the rougher areas in this, you see a lot of, uh, you know, tin-sided buildings, really rough structures in some of those areas. When I was here nine years ago, it was, that was everywhere. And now I have to walk miles and go into areas no one would ever go into to experience it. And that's very different. And what's happened is tons of new uh, development has gone in and replaced what was there before. So there's Nicaragua is on this trajectory of massive construction and improvement and, and more modernization um, on, on a Nicaragua scale, right? It, it is a different thing. But uh, Costa Rica has been there for a long time, and uh, uh, you will feel it, right? So um, all of these countries are great options. Understanding that, especially these three, I think have very different, if you're taking the knobs of how polished it is, how expat communities, how many, right, these have their knobs all turned in very different uh, directions, whereas uh, the Northern Triangle, the Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, you're going to find those knobs a lot closer to each other, and they share a lot more similarities, both with each other and to some degree with Nicaragua, Costa Rica and Panama are the least like Nicaragua of the group. So they're the most dramatic. If you're looking for a short list, you definitely want to put El Salvador on that uh, more than more than Guatemala or, or Honduras. Personally, Guatemala for me, absolutely fantastic. That would be my second choice of where I've spent time, what I know currently. Um, Honduras is, is still great. I love Honduras, uh, but it falls much more, uh, uh, much more down the list, partially because it's still rough around the edges like Nicaragua, but it has the, the highest crime, crime of, the, of the region now. Um, and that's uh, something they're working very hard on. I have no worries going to Honduras. I would live there, blink of an eye if I had to, but it's got a lot of great competition from the region, but it's also up and coming. So I'm really interested in seeing what they've done in the last couple of years, and maybe they're gonna move up on the list. We're gonna see, but uh, let's get on to Panama. Panama, I think, falls into a really nice middle ground. And for a lot of people, this is fantastic. It gives you enough 
expats and enough tourists and enough resources that you don't have the feeling like you've fallen off the end of the earth and you have no idea where you are and you have no idea how you're going to do things. It doesn't have that kind of challenge. It's a very wealthy, very connected, very resource intensive country. But the majority of those resources, the majority of the beautiful houses, the majority of the beautiful neighborhoods, the majority of the gated enclaves are all Panamanian not expats. Expats certainly exist. There are expat enclaves. There's areas that are predominantly expats, but, and, and there's lots of expats in the country. You can always find one. So unlike Nicaragua, where you can end up in these really remote areas and be like, well, I just really can't find an expat. You're, you're or it's really struggling just one or two. That almost never happens. You, you really do have a fair number that you can get to in nearly any part of the country. Adio. But you, uh, you, you also have a very expat feeling. The same areas that in a Nicaragua or a Costa Rica would be almost entirely expats are actually Panamanian in Panama. And that is, is really nice. That is really cool and provides a very different uh, overall feeling. And when I lived there, we lived in a really nice area, but far outside the city. So it wasn't expensive. It was just really nice. And sometimes the people we would run into who were vacationing there were Costa Rican because it's so easy for them to get there. And Costa Ricans often are so affluent, it's very easy for them to go there. So it's a, it's a, it gives a completely different feel on one side than, than Nicaragua and on others, it's, it's incredibly similar. So uh, the, the really nice thing that Panama has to offer, the really different thing compared to Nicaragua beyond every little community being much richer, right? There are many, many, many small villages that are very affluent, very, you know, well-kept. It's, it's, it is a different feeling. In, in, it, it never makes you feel like you're not in Central America, but it gives you that, but Central America on a European budget kind of feeling. Uh, and that's, that's really nice. And that's a very big difference compared to here. Now, this is a fantastic view of the same volcano. This is still San Cristo Cristobal, but I got to show it from here. And this, I really got to get a good camera out here so you can see it in, in a good lens. But there with the giant guanacaste tree on the right. Okay. So, so I like Panama for that, for this totally different who owns it feeling. And it's, it's hard to describe, but the biggest thing is Panama city is so urbane, even compared to San Jose, even though it's smaller than San Jose, it is a dense high rise based city. Uh, it's got, you know, really ultra modern buildings everywhere. San Jose is much older. Uh, in a lot of the city, um, it's it's much lower lying. It does have high rises. It's not it's not flat like Nicaragua, but uh, it's it's again in between. Panama goes to a whole new level, and there's nothing like it in uh, in Central America. And technically, Panama is not Central America. And Panama City lies on the South American side of the the kind of the divide. But most of Panama lies in geographic Central America, but it's not considered so. Uh, but does give you the feeling of it. It's but the population is mostly in the city. Having the canal there is beautiful. It has islands near the city. There's a lot to like about Panama. And if you told me I couldn't live in Nicaragua and I couldn't live in Guatemala and I had to pick Costa Rica or Panama, both would make me absolutely happy. Both are wonderful countries I would consider no, no problem. Both I love to visit uh, and Costa Rica I go to all the time, but Panama I would prefer to go to most of the time because it has the things I want and I miss it terribly. Um, and I really want to get down there and film this year. That would be fantastic. There's, I want to see what it's done in the years since I've been there. It's been nine years since I lived there. Wow, that's something to say. It feels like I was there pretty recently, but that's the last time that I actually lived there. And uh, what a great country it is though. So so all of them are options. Um, Panama is going to fall from a monetary perspective as, as generally, not 100% not of the time. Generally, you're going to find Panama to be less expensive than Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is the most expensive for general everyday living for most of the things you want to do uh, anywhere in the region. That includes the Mexicos, that includes the, the Chiles, all of that you expect to spend the most in Costa Rica. Of course, any place you could find some way to spend a lot of money. So you might find an, a pocket of more expensive somewhere. But it, for the average person, Costa Rica is going to have the highest cost for the most average number of things. Uh, but Panama is still a very wealthy country. And 
you're going to have a lot of cost. But if you live in Panama with the same income, um, and, and in reality, Panamanians have a slightly higher income than Costa Ricans, so they have a lot more buying power uh, in, their, in their own country. They have higher salaries by a little bit with lower cost of living by a little bit. It's a really nice combination, of course. So it's hard to do a complete comparison between three different countries on a just walking around show like this, but uh, but th that's my take on it. Um, we, you know, we show Costa Rica here on the show. I'm definitely gonna get down and film Panama. I've got to. And one of my best friends lives in Panama and, and she would love to be on the show. She's not, she's not shy, just doesn't have time to do. Uh, too many, too many shows like this on her own, uh, but she does like doing podcasts and, and does a lot of media stuff. Oh, she's a professional actress. So I'm, I'm hoping that at some point I can convince her to come on and do quite a bit of the show with me. If I can get down to Panama, she will, she will put in some time and uh, we'll, we'll tour around and do some really interesting stuff. So we'll, we'll make that happen at some point. But yeah, so that's my take. That's my take. All great options. Um, ask specific questions. Definitely get down. Let me know what it is you, you really want to know about them. That's kind of my, my high-level view. But you can't go wrong. Definitely shortlist countries. Um, also, if you're looking at those, my question would be, why didn't you mention Guatemala? It's amazing. I understand why uh, Honduras especially is, is a little bit hesitant for people to put on the list. It's still relatively dangerous. It's a nice place. <laughs> Como esta? <laughs> that is the guy and horse that pick up my trash in the morning. Um, the uh, Honduras, you know, it's, it's, it requires a little bit of an adventurous spirit uh, to consider Honduras at this point. And Guatemala, you know, still has some tough stuff. And right this moment, they got some political stuff going on. So, you know, it, maybe today is not the day to go to Guatemala. But in general, um, these are very decent countries to consider. The, of the ones in the region, Guatemala is, is a strong contender. Uh, and El Salvador is as well. That is the safest of all the countries in the region and is very inexpensive, much more like Nicaragua, a little bit more, but not as, uh, uh, not as expensive as, as Costa Rica and Panama. Uh, and so that should really, your shortlist should be much larger. Central America is just broadly amazing and, and everyone has something to offer. And it, the thing is not that there's one specific gem. Of course, if I was to say there was one specific gem, I'd say it was Nicaragua. That's why I'm here. But if I wasn't here, every single one of them is well worth considering. It is just a wonderful region. Uh, but they are all very different and each have very different offerings for you. Okay, next up, the question was, uh, he said he loved the idea of hiring someone to go do shopping for you. This is like, you don't want to go to the grocery store. Uh, you don't know where to shop. You don't want to go to the market, which I'm walking by the, the little markets just over there. And it can be daunting. It can be time consuming and you may not get good prices. So how can you tackle this as a foreigner who's living here? Especially this was on the episode about being a digital nomad. Uh, how can you make digital nomading uh, more lucrative so that you have more time to focus on things that make you money and less time spent trying to figure out how to buy you know, papaya. Uh, so the thing that I said is, um, one, consider having a live-in chef or something of, the, of that nature that's going to cook for you uh, or clean your house or all those things. That's fantastic. But taking that a step further, um, and most of the people who do that would also do this, and that is uh, consider having someone that will go out and do your shopping for you. And of course, that could be done once every two weeks, once a week, twice a week, whatever makes sense. And uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It doesn't have to be a huge project. Or, or it could be someone that's full-time working for you, and this is just something they do as part of their job. And they said, how do you handle that? Well, the first piece is yes, you just hand them money and, and have them go, go do the shopping. You can have them get receipts or at least write down what they get. You can, you can do some amount of auditing with that. Um, and his question was really, okay, so you're handing them money. How do you know that they're not just skimming off the top and, and taking a bunch of the money? Well, to some degree, you don't really know, but you can do some things to check. So first of all, if you're sending them to the market, you're gonna have a receipt and you can look at it and check or spot check and make sure that the amount that you're getting in, in change match, matches what they're getting from the grocery store. That's if they're going to a Pali, a Maxi Pali, a La Colonia, a La Union and similar. <clears throat> but that's not really where the fear is. But those are addressed. The question is when you hand them cash and they go to the little market, how do you know they're not skimming off the top? Well, to some degree, you're not gonna know, you're never gonna know with any employee that something somewhere hasn't gone awry. Uh, we've all been stolen from in the United States from time to time, it happens, right? So no, there's, a, there's not a 100% guarantee 
on anything, and that's unfortunate, but uh, for the most part, not everyone's out looking to get you. That's not a thing. Everyone feels that here because so many people who come looking for you. Oh, I'd love to do this job for you. Oh, do you have work for me? Well, they're, they're coming looking for you as a foreigner because they wanna take advantage of you. So you tend to encounter those people when they're looking for you with quite a degree of frequency. But when you're out looking for someone to do a job, you encounter it at a normal frequency, which is still a little bit, but it's not terrible. But there are still things you can do to improve your likelihood of success. You can, of course, hire someone that is well trusted, that you have a reason to have faith in. Uh, maybe they worked for you for a long time and you've grown faith in them over time. That doesn't help you right away, of course. So things you can do is, for example, spot checking. You can, especially if you're living here, you'll certainly know people, right? You can ask what prices should be. And that does not mean that you'll never uh, not have someone skim something off the top, but you can get a pretty good idea of what you should be paying. And when you keep track of it, it would be pretty obvious if there's any real amount missing. And if a few cents go missing, if so little goes missing that you can't find it, does it really matter? They may be, you know, negotiating an amazing price on your mangoes and you're just getting a normal market price on your mangoes and they're pocketing the difference. Is that right? No, it's not. But the harder the job they do, they don't get anything for it. Otherwise, it's not the worst thing in the world either. They're being compensated for their hard work and maybe they split the difference with you and they're getting, you know, 50 cents out of it and you're saving 50 cents. A lot of these things are very small numbers and keep that in mind. But yeah, you can't, uh, you can't guarantee that they won't take advantage of the situation at all, but you can make sure that you're getting reasonable Nicaraguan prices, maybe with a little bit of research and a little bit of time, but you're not sending them to the market for a million different random things. That had nettles, uh, but you're sending them for very specific things. And when you do that, I love all these flowers. When you do that, uh, you have time to figure out how much it costs, how much it should cost, have a feel over time, and, 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 and make sure you, you are getting a good deal. It's really not as scary and worrisome and problematic as it sounds. So many expats come to Nicaragua and try to live this completely expat-y life and, the, and notice, so those of us who, who live very integrated, we all have stories of where someone's taken advantage of us. We got a lawyer that didn't do a good job. We got someone tried to, tried to rip us off on a land deal, or, you know, we all have those stories. When you're, when you're a foreigner in, in a country and you have a outsized income compared to the average, uh, you're going to naturally have uh, interactions that are different. This would be the same as if you came to the US and lived like that. It doesn't matter where you go. It is the ratio of income to the environment. You put yourself into a place where anyone in that scenario ends up with something like these stories going on. Doesn't mean you're being ripped off. It just means that people are looking for ways to get money out of you. It's going to happen. So accepting that and understanding you're in a totally different income and tax bracket than, than the people around you. When you notice the people who are constantly like, oh, it just never ends, it's so hard, it's terrible, and it is often for them, you'll notice that they're the people who are not trying to learn Spanish. Typically, there's exceptions, but typically they're not spending a lot of time learning Spanish. They're not uh, living among uh, the Nicaraguans. They're in enclaves. They're in very uh, uh, expat communities or little tiny groups, and they're they're really spending their time. Um, and of course, we all hang out with people from our own countries, right? It, it's going to happen. You you know, you just get to know each other. You have a lot of shared experiences. So of course, you're going to hang out. And there's lots of wonderful people in those groups. Um, so naturally, you're going to have some amount of interaction with them. But it, it's really noticeable that the people who are living here and trying to live like it's Nicaragua have very few experiences like this. And people who are attempting to get the advantages of living in Nicaragua, they want the, the, the super cheap housekeeping, they want the, someone to go shopping, they want to live near a market, they want to have all the things that we often talk about on the show, but they also want to have this feeling of being in an enclave and they're trying to split the difference. They're the ones who, who are generally having those problems. They lack the, the knowledge. They're not going out and doing things themselves, typically. Um, I think I'm actually bleeding from that plant. <laughs> I can feel it. Um, and, and they're not uh, getting to know the prices themselves. It's not just that they're not putting in the effort. They're often trying to separate themselves. And that separation uh, creates a risk and creates a knowledge 
to everyone around you that you're not connected to the community and won't know when the price has dropped. You won't know when something should be a deal. You don't know when you're getting a good deal or not. Like just a lot of things you don't know and you kind of end up highlighting it. And so, and again, there's so many of these things it's not wrong to do that, right? If what you want is to live in an enclave and be completely enclavey, that's okay. If you want to be completely non-enclavey and just completely part of Nicaragua, that's okay. If you want to try to split the difference, that is also okay. Each one comes with benefits, each one comes with caveats. If you want to live like me, very much a part of Nicaragua, a lot of the things that people worry about aren't really problems. But I don't have really good access to a lot of like amazing restaurants and selection of things. I don't have a lot of the luxury things that a lot of people are looking for. A lot of people just assume when they're talking about Nicaragua and, and I talk to them and they're just like, well, I'm assuming I'm going to, you know, live on a beach, have ocean view. I'm going to have restaurants and all this like really fancy stuff that very little of Nicaragua has and very few Nicaraguans may even be aware of. And it's like, oh, you're, you're really thinking of a different world than the one I'm in day to day. And again, it's fantastic. I would love some of that stuff. That'd be great. That'd be really cool. But I can't realistically have the world that I have and that one. That'd be very difficult. You don't generally get the best of both. You would end up getting the worst of both, right? So, so, you know, if I wanted to do enclave living, I'd have to change my life. I could go do that, but I prefer this, but I can see why you would prefer that. It's a, it's a, it's a simple tip of the balance as to which one is going to be right for you. And then the people who try to split the difference, they get some of, they get to walk the line, right? They get some of the good stuff from that, some of the good stuff from this, but they get some of the problems from both as well. And so you, you, you just kind of have to, you have to accept that that's what's happening, right? And so uh, there's no, there's no simple answer there. So yes, if you're, if you're trying to walk that line and you're trying to uh, be in the country in that way, there's a lot more risk that people are going to skim. Not totally take advantage of you, just maybe you're not going to get the deals you thought you were, you were hoping to get. But chances are, if you're living like that, it's not as important to you either. If you're living like me and, and we really spend like we're Nicaraguans, pretty baller Nicaraguans, but we shop and live and do everything like Nicaraguans, uh, then we notice those things because we're very steeped in it and we pay a lot of attention and we're connected and we know other people that do it and there's a million references, right? For us, if our, if our chef was buying mangoes that were too expensive, first of all, our chef would never do that. But if they did, right, our, our uh, major domo would catch it or our security would catch it or there's so many eyes on the same things and, uh, you know, everyone's looking out for us because we, we treat them like family and it is like family, right? We're all in this together and, uh, um, it just it creates a different experience. So uh, those are the questions for today. It was a nice walk. It is a beautiful day. I'm about to have dinner. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. And uh, as always, if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That really helps with everything that we do here. I hope you're enjoying what we're doing for the new content. Again, let me know more stuff that you want to know about how things work, what we can talk about, places to travel, all that stuff. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow. Look at these cute dogs. They're so little. Hey. Hey. Don't show fear to dogs. A little bit of tip there. <laughs>